chapter three, new civilizations in East Asia, Africa, and Europe from 2200 BCE. So we're traveling kind of around the, you know, kind of spreading out of our, of our area of the Mediterranean, the Middle East a little bit. Okay, what are the sections of our chapter? Um, early China, uh, Nubia, uh, pastoral nomads of the Eurasian steppes, and we'll learn what a steppe is in Celtic Europe. So this chapter will look at other civilizations in other parts of the world besides the, you know, by this time, mostly self-sufficient river valley civilizations of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Mediterranean that we looked at in chapters one and two. And as we've already learned, the rise of settlements, trading centers, cities, got, you know, led to government leadership, and this could many times be harsh. I would almost say in most times it was harsh. But also writing and other advanced technologies developed out of the agriculture that developed in these ancient river civilizations because people are staying in one place and you have time to ponder and and research and think because you're not always on the go so what comes out of that is technology okay okay the first section is called early china and the question asked by your textbook how did early chinese leaders use religion to justify and strengthen their power so let's start with a film. Let's look at our first film. Please watch the film entitled Ancient Chinese Civilization Explained, and then come on back and we'll continue. Okay, so early China. Uh, early settlements in China followed the same pattern as anywhere else. They established around the delta or the flood pan of the Yellow River or the Yangtze River. So here, here you see these two rivers. The Yellow River here goes far inland. And of course, it's right here where that river valley civilization would develop. And then the other river was the Yangtze River, also goes deep into the interior, but where the civilization um, would develop would be, would be you know, where it empties into the sea. And of course, today, this is where Shanghai would be, okay, in China. Um, okay, um, China's different from a lot of these early civilizations. I've probably mentioned this before. It's it's isolated by the tallest mountain chain in the world, the Himalayas or the Himalayas or the Himalayas. Either one works, okay? So here you see the kind of map where, you know, Pakistan and Middle East and Europe's over there and, you know, India, it's hard to get over to China because you got this this natural geographic boundary you can't just cross these mountains they're huge and here you see a satellite um uh, picture the same uh in chain where it's it, it's it's formidable and and very 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 tall and uh so it's isolated by the himalayan or himalayan mountains uh, mount everest the largest mountain in the world 29,029 29 feet tall tallest mountain in the world is in the himalayans uh, so, like I said, difficult to travel across these lands. Uh, let's take our next break here and watch the film entitled, Why is Mount Everest So Tall? And this will give us kind of the story of Mount Everest itself and why, why is it so tall? Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, back, so back to our two rivers. Uh, they provided passage into the interior. Both are very important to the development of China. Uh, the, the geography in China is diverse. In, in, the, in the north, rainfall is not plentiful. So you see the brown, the yellow kind of symbolizes not that much rainfall. It starts to turn green, then blue, then dark blue means much rainfall. But in the north, rainfall, not plentiful. People needed to rely on agriculture, but it required much labor in the north because you had to store and manage water. Uh, and of course, the labor results in the inevitable separ separation of the classes, ruling, ruling class versus working class. But in the south, where it's blue or green, dark blue, uh, rainfall was plentiful. So, so uh, it, it perhaps didn't, didn't take as much management because you didn't have to manage the water. So especially during the summer monsoon season where where you 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 get uh you know a tremendous amount of water so so china really developed as two distinct regions north and south that were much different from each other okay um and interesting for centuries you have what's called the less this is a yellowish dust uh blown blown down east from central asia the less okay 
this soil would be blown into the uh, to, to the west and would help to enrich the soils of these two rivers. So this is a yellowish dust, and that's why the Yellow River is called the Yellow River, because it looks yellow from all the dust or the less that's blown into it from the east, from the west, I should say. I, I should have said blowing blowing east from the west, okay? And so this would en enrich the soils of these two rivers. This, of course, is great for agriculture. Uh, its yellow color is where the river's name came from, like I said. It's how the river plains develop such rich soil, as well as the minerals being dropped by the water of the river uh, after its long journey from the inland, okay? Uh, so, of course, this is still important in modern China. In modern China today, the, the Les Plateau is still a very you know, significant area of China, and they're constantly doing what they can to get the most out of it. Okay, let's, let's go to our next film. Uh, please watch the film entitled Lessons of the Les Plateau, also called Los. You'll hear it in different names. Like many, uh, you know, names of of what we would call as Americans foreign language. Okay, we we tend to westernize a lot of these pronunciations, so you, you you'll hear it different ways. Please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so Chinese crops, of course, were grains, and and going way back, such as millet and wheat, and both did very well in the southern region where there was the most water. Okay. But but the staple of China is rice, and we all know about Chinese rice. China is famous for, you know, its rice, and so so the rice would mostly grow along the Yangtze River because it was in the south where all the water was. Now rice demands much labor, and as I said before, the separation of people into classes, ruling elite and the worker starts, and this is an age-old part of any country's history. Uh, the problem with, with working in a rice field is that if you had a choice, you probably wouldn't choose to do it. So you had to somewhat subjugate these people. I'm talking about way back, okay, in the, in the era that we're in. You had to subjugate these people to do the work they wouldn't do it on their own. This is, this is where slavery develops. It's work that people wouldn't do on their own. You have to force them, okay? So rice is a staple of China today. It demands much labor. And is it? It's tough to do. And here you see, so you stooped over knee-high water. Um, so rice paddies were flat, and they would it would require flooding them for the rice to grow. So you would you would plant it when it was dry, then you'd flood it and let it stay flooded for a while. And then that meant that the workers were standing in knee-deep water all day, stooping over, and so on. So why do they flood it? it? It eliminates weeds and other plants, but it created an awful work environment. As the rice matures underwater, the patties were drained and the crop harvested, okay? So it's interesting. Most of us eat rice, but we have no idea how it was grown. Uh, the next film is a British couple, and then this, this truly is some modern YouTubers uh, that have, a, you know, have their kind of channel and following and probably on their travels around the world. But this is kind of an interesting one. This tells us the interesting story of how rice is grown. So please watch the film entitled How Does Rice Grow? And when you're finished with that, come on back. Okay, China is also known for its silk, very famous for its silk. Uh, one of the, and we've talked about this, one of the items that the rest of the world wanted. And why the explorers went out into the world wasn't to so much explore, it was to get to China to, to, to get that silk and those spices. So silk is actually taken from silk worms. You see them on the left there. In mulberry trees, very interesting, and and then taking their cocoons and unraveling the silk from it. Uh, this would be then woven into a silk cloth. Uh, this is this was very popular in the ancient world as well as today. Okay, let's watch our next film. Uh, this is entitled "How Silk Is Made from Silkworms." Uh, please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so China has always had a hold on trade, and most of the rest of the world always wanted a key to that, and a lot of it comes from this product of silk. Uh, China became very wealthy, and the silk roads were called silk roads because people wanted to get this silk that was, was manufactured by these, uh, by these silk worms, okay? So I, I like to bring the present to the to the past or the past to the present anytime I can to illustrate the importance of the past, how it links 
to the present, this this to me is why history is a relevant subject today. We're talking about the ancient world, but if you study it and look at it in, in a certain way, you can see that we really are mirrors of the past. So uh, we're going to go to our next film here. Uh, this is entitled China's Trillion Dollar Planet Dominate Global Trade. This is an interesting modern day idea, but it, it uses all the same silk, silk roads and the idea of trade. Uh, most of it has to do with China's ancient past, but again, it, it you're, you're seeing how how the present, you know, these same ancient ancient trade routes, the Silk Roads, the Indian Ocean maritime trade over these ancient sea routes are still being used, and it hasn't changed that much. Okay, so we talked about about the the Silk and uh, I'm sorry, the history of trade in, in supplemental lecture number one. That the history of humans parallels the history of trade. So here's an example. Watch the film, and you can see where the ancient era is just the same as we are today. So please go ahead and watch that film, and then come on back. Okay. So so again, same ancient trade routes being used today, and China has this has this kind of grand plan and is becoming an economic uh, you know giant in the world. And uh, of course, p uh, uh, people like the United States and Germany are watching ch are watching China. Like, wow, they've they've got a pretty good plan here. But truly, it's all about trade. In instead of camels, you know, we we're talking about modern China here. We're, we're using, you know, uh, container ships and and we use uh, trucks and you know, planes are too small to ship large quantities. So goods are. are still shipped over land and overseas just like in the old days we have railroads that, that once these containers get to land they are then put on railroads and trains and taken to wherever they're they're going to go okay so point i'm trying to make is <clears throat> history of humans parallels the history of trade here you are we're still doing it this is the same idea that was going on in the ancient times okay Okay, back to our back to our era talking about China. China enters the Bronze Age, 2000 BCE, a full 1,000 years after the Middle East. So, is China behind? I mean, not necessarily. China didn't have the same uh, conflicts because they were so isolated. They didn't have warfare. You know, war, warfare leads to to invention and 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 engineering and technology. China didn't have that the same type of of conflict, so they they got to it slower. Okay, uh, so the first dynasty in China is the Shang. Okay, it's not pronounced Shang; it's pronounced Shang. Okay, so another you'll hear it that way, but that's another Westernized pronunciation of of a of a name that should be Shang. Uh, the Shang start in the Yellow River Valley. There's the map there, that Yellow River Valley. And they grow from there. They they were prominent 1750 to 1045 BCE, so 600, uh, six seven hundred years. Okay, so the origin of the Shang uh, is is what has become recognized as what we would see as Chinese culture today. Okay, and the, with the art and the architecture, it all begins with the Shang. Uh, so the Shang were were warlike, fierce people. And of course, you've heard this before. Most of them were in those days, uh, and you could argue that a lot of countries today are pretty are pretty warlike and fierce. Okay, so the Shang had a warrior aristocracy, and they and they had many military campaigns. They utilized the chariot also as an effective method of war, as a weapon of war. Uh, there was much stability in China during this period, led to numerous cultural advances, such as industrialized bronze casting, the calendar, religious rituals, and writing. All came from China. Uh, their capital was Anyang, the Shang Dynasty capital Anyang, uh, was a center of trade, uh, included palaces, administration buildings, large city, and they were the centers of politics and religion. Uh, these capitals also had shrines and royal tombs, and of course these are archaeological excavations that are found, and and we learn much from these from these uh, digs. We learn that the elites lived in luxury while peasants lived in huts outside the palace. So again, much like the American South pre-Civil War, you got the plantation home with the with the owner elite. Uh, family planter aristocracy living in the big house while the slaves are in the shacks in the back. 
We've also found evidence of pictograms, so archaeological evidence of pictograms and phonetic symbols that represent sound and symbols of these ancient times. And we learned that, that the Shang developed a sophisticated system of signs. And truly, only an elite man with an education in that time could become master of this system and become fluent in these pictograms. Uh, like, like other civilizations, the king had all the power. He was an absolute ruler, was believed to be an intermediary between the people and the heavens. So not quite, you know, a god, but somebody, somewhere in between. Uh, some of their rituals and ceremonies included human sacrifice. So here you see an archaeological dig where they find grave sites. And what's unique about, about, about this is that all the heads are missing. So these these people were sacrificed and beheaded in some tort, sort of ceremony. Uh, okay, the first king of the Shang was Tong. So again, it's not King Tang of Chang, it's King Tong of Shang, okay? Uh, king uh, Tong worked for the people of its country instead of for his own pleasure and luxury. Very unusual. He provided a role model for his successors and was able to create a stable government that was passed on that lasted for 600 years. So I mentioned before, they came late to the Bronze Age. Uh, and part of it was, like I said, they didn't have the need so much, but also because bronze was scarce. But as they got into it and, and became experts at it, uh, shaping bronze item, items became a Shang staple and was something that they were known for. And they, these items would, would be used to adorn burial tombs of the elites. And they would they would bury the the uh, the person with many bronze items. Um, and it, and it was scarce. So you can you can see how important the elites were to them, where they would get so they would lavish these bronze items on the dead, even though bronze was scarce scarce. So the Shang developed far-reaching trade networks. As all the successful civilizations did, we talked about that, like like all the rest. The history of humans parallels the history of trade. Uh, the Shang traded their goods for jade, ivory, mother of pearl. Uh, finally, overthrown by King Wu of the Zhou. Okay, the Zhou Dynasty. Uh, you see it there in the middle. Z H O U, pronounced Zhou. Not so much Zhou like the name, but Zhou. Okay. Uh, Overthrown by King Wu of the Zhou in 1027 BCE, and the Zhou dynasty begins 1027 to 221, so 800 years BCE. Uh, the Shang, but understand, the Zhou dynasty overthrew them, but the Shang dynasty is responsible for the foundations of Chinese culture and civilization. The Zhou would simply build on that, okay? Uh, and like I said, lasted longer than the Shang, 800 years. These are these are long-lasting dynasties. So the long history of the Zhou dynasty is normally divided into two different periods. You have the Western Zhou, 1046, 771 BCE, and the Eastern Zhou, 770 to 256. Uh, so the, the center of power uh, change kind of followed the move at, of the Zhou capital eastward, where it was felt it was safer from invasion. So they moved it east uh, inland. Okay, so the the Zhou era is considered to be a time of intellectual and artistic awakening, uh, and a and a ruler who lost what they call the mandate of heaven could possibly lose his his rule. So the mandate of heaven, what what is that? The mandate of heaven determined whether an emperor, emperor of China was sufficiently virtuous to rule. So this is not the same as, as divine right given by God, where it didn't matter if you were a, a good or bad leader. You could be a horrible person, but if you were that bloodline, you would be become the king. Not, not so in China. Uh, Chinese rulers had to maintain what is called the mandate of heaven. And if they didn't fulfill their obligations as emperor, they would lose the mandate and thus the right to be emperor. So what are the four principles of the mandate of heaven? Uh, number one, heaven grants the emperor the right to rule. So, so understand, still from God, but, but the right to rule, not just no matter what you do, okay? You have, to, you, you have to be worthy. So number two, since there's only one heaven, there can only be one emperor any given time. 
uh, the emperor's virtue determines his right to rule. No one dynasty has a permanent right to rule. If you lose your mandate of heaven, you're going to be removed. So what's interesting about that? This is a very ancient inkling of a democracy, right? This is if you don't do what we expect you to do, we're going to get rid of you, okay? Uh, so the Zhou continued some of the Shang practices, but not human sacrifice. Okay, that kind of ended with the Shang. Uh, the Zhou also began an, another idea that became not so much modern, but part of American history, not only a couple hundred, 250 years ago, the idea of a separation between the church and the government. The, the Zhou is a very early example of that ideal, where they they decide that they don't want to mix religion with politics and keep them separate, okay? And you shouldn't have politics based on a religion like a lot of the later European countries will do. So this, is, this would become a very American ideal, the idea of separation between church and state is in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution today, okay? Okay, that is the end of uh, Chapter 3, Part 1. Please go to uh, Part 3. I'm sorry, uh, Chapter 3, Part 2. Thank you.